good morning. And on behalf of CIMH, I'd like to welcome you to the School to Prison Pipeline Stop the Cycle Juvenile Justice Roundtable. Um, I am Sharon Wright and I'm with CIMH. And I will be co-moderating today, today's event with um, Dr. Karen Kurosaki. Um, before we also get started, I would like to thank our sponsors today, which is um, the California Endowment, Health Happens Here. And I also would like to um, thank the Juvenile Justice Planning Committee. Um, this all wouldn't have been ha um, possible if we wouldn't have been able to have their feedback and input to get us um, going. Uh, today, we have come together in response to the nation's school to prison pipeline action, call to action. The phrase school to prison pipeline refers to the practice of pushing students out of the classroom and into the justice system through the use of discipline, uh, discipline policies. This is not a new problem. This is actually a historical issue. Um, just to give you an example, in 1961, President John F. Kennedy signed the Juvenile Justice, uh, excuse me, the Juvenile Delinquency and Youth Offenses Control Act. And this legislation instructed the federal government to become active members with state and local communities to prevent and control the spread of delinquency. Today, we meet as the first step. Um, however, we will not be able to, you know, um, resolve this matter. We will be able to shift the focus to reform. Um, CIMH is here today to um, gather recommendations that come out of today's presentation and today's event. And we will be calling on many of you to partner with and to go ahead and move this agenda forward. So at this time, um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the moderator of our first uh, panel, and that is Dr. Karen Kurosaki. Well, once again, uh, welcome to all of you and good morning. Uh, really pleased to see all of you here with us today. It is a distinct privilege for me to be able to introduce to you our first panel entitled Examining the Challenges of the School to Prison Pipeline, which will delve into some of the practices and risk factors associated with students going from the classroom into the justice system. We'll also examine the common offenses that lead to youth uh, lead youth, excuse me, to the juvenile justice system, and we'll take a look at some of the demographic makeup of the juvenile justice system. I'm joined by my three esteemed colleagues, uh, starting off with uh, Dr. Uh, Khalif Asagai, who is um, legislative and policy director of NAMI and also uh, serves on the Sacramento County Juvenile Justice Commission. So welcome. Thank you, Thank you for being here. He just clarified that he's not a doctor. <laughs> JD. <laughs> Thank you for that clarification. Um, also, um, we're very grateful um, to have with us Dr. William Arroyo, uh, who is a regional medical director with the Department of Mental Health in Los Angeles County. Welcome, Dr. Arroyo. Thank you for being here. And finally, I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Shadidi Siamat, who is uh, with the education, uh, pardon me, he's the education programs consultant with the California Department of Education. Uh, welcome to you, Dr. Siamat, and thank you for being here. I understand that we are tightly scheduled today, and I also understand that you have uh, their full bios um, in your packet, so rather than reading all of them, I think it'd be more important for me to reserve all the time to hear um, their knowledge that they bring with us um, to us today. So I encourage you to take a look at that when you have a chance so that you can uh, get a sense of the depth of knowledge and experience that they have on this topic that we are addressing today and why we have invited them to be here today. Um, <clears throat> and I, uh, I understand that uh, the order uh, that they will be speaking in uh, is going from uh, your, your left to right. <laughs> um, and so um, I'm, I'm going to just um, let them um, monitor themselves. I'm not going to keep reintroducing them in between each talk. So um, I'll just go ahead at this time and uh, hand it over to our presenters. And as, as I do that, if you could please join me with a warm welcome for all three of our presenters.
Um, good morning again. My name is Khalif Asagai. I am Legislation and Public Policy Director at Melanie, California, and also a Sacramento County Juvenile Justice Commissioner. Uh, my interest in juvenile justice uh, emanates from my time working for Senator, now infamous Senator Leland Yee, when I um, helped to staff the Juvenile Life Without Parole Bill, which was meant to eliminate juvenile, juvenile life without parole for, um, for all offenders under 18 in California. In law school at UCLA, I did my research. Thank you. In law school at UCLA, I did my research on um, busting the, the school to prison pipeline, specifically looking at school discipline issues and how that contributes to the incarceration of our youth, especially the, the disparate incarceration of people of color. Um, so it was an honor to be selected to serve on the Juvenile Justice Commission here in Sacramento County. And our presiding judge of the juvenile court is also here today, Judge Bulwer Yuri. And she is a great leader in addressing these issues and you know, taking things uh, straight on. So the Juvenile Justice Commission is a commission of the Sacramento County Court. And there is a Juvenile Justice Commission in each county in the state tasked with essentially overseeing the operation of the juvenile court as well as juvenile detention facilities in an advisory role. Um, we do not make policy, um, but we are able to give recommendations, review uh, procedures, and inspect facilities to ensure that they're in compliance with the law. Part of our, um, we're an advisory commission, uh, again, so we are able to make recommendations as to what we think would be most helpful um, in serving the youth in our facilities. Um, our commission is made up of a lot of folks who have been in the, uh, have worked in uh, the criminal justice system and folks who have worked also outside in uh, community-based organizations who care deeply about children. So our focus is really ensuring that um, our system is doing more than just incarcerating but is providing opportunities for individuals to change their lives within the system and is treating everybody with dignity and respect. So some of the things that um, juvenile justice commissions can do is um, weigh in on whether or not the appropriate services are available, whether or not the education is, uh, the educational needs of the students are being met, um, as well as whether or not there is a, or abuses of power and other types of things. Um, these are things that all juvenile justice commissions are able to weigh into. Our commission is also the Delinquency Prevention Commission, which is really more appropriate for this crowd because what we're really looking at is how can we keep kids from entering the system to begin with. Um, the best thing that we can do is focus on prevention and not rehabilitation. And so we have to look at what type of policies are leading students into the juvenile justice system and how we can address them working with community members, um, working with um, probation and other government organizations to ensure that the services that they need are in place, both in the schools and the facilities, to ensure that, the, um, that there are alternatives to incarceration, for example, looking at restorative justice and neighborhood accountability boards, things that do more than punish, but that show students that they have the opportunity to achieve, that people in the community care about them, and that there are things that they can do to put their life on the right path um, rather than engaging in, in so-called criminal behavior. At the same time, we have to look at what is criminal behavior in the context of pushing students from the classroom into the juvenile justice, uh, uh, into the juvenile justice system. And that has a lot to do with school discipline issues and how students are uh, treated at school whether and what the response is to poor behavior. So as we all know, um, there are zero tolerance policies. So some students who are engaged in activities on campuses are automatically expelled or is suspended or pushed out of the educational system. Um, a big part of delinquency prevention is providing opportunities in the educational system for kids to learn, grow, and develop, and definitely learn from their mistakes. So the restorative justice model is something that our commission is currently looking at um, and figuring out a way to provide those opportunities, uh, both uh, making recommendations potentially to schools about what the best practices would be from our perspective, um, as well as working with probation to say, what can we do for low-level offenders who really have an opportunity to reform um, but have been dragged into the system based on their behavior in school? So um, we really act as a convening body to bring together different organizations and folks to find solutions um, to these problems and try and keep kids, again, from entering the system to begin with. So the um, top offenses in the, state of, in the county of Sacramento um, that are leading kids into the 
the youth det detention facility um, are possession of marijuana, robbery, battery, assault, burglary, receiving stolen property, and vehicle theft. Um, those crimes may be committed in the community or in, on a school campus. Um, and we, we don't have data that shows specifically kind of what the breakdown is. But what we can say is that the school environment is one that should be productive and supportive and should allow kids to learn um, a great deal about themselves and, life, and their lives and their challenges without automatically, based on each mistake, being pushed into the juvenile justice system. Some of these uh, crimes are bad. Uh, possession of marijuana for sale clearly is something that we should never do. However, ch children are facing challenges um, that sometimes they're not sure how to address. And they make mistakes. And one of our goals is to say, when those mistakes are made, how can we approach them in a productive manner that will help to not only show that person that they have accountability only to themselves, not only to themselves, but to their family and their community and their school campus, but also um, to the people who, who are harmed by their particular crime or misbehavior. So we are striving to um, gather data, um, work with other organizations and probation to really find solutions to this problem to help to keep kids um, out of the system to begin with. And so kids can enter the adult system through a couple of ways. Um, judicial waiver is one, um, which is um, basically a, somebody being adjudicated, um, I guess, that the, a judge deciding that it would be better that they are served in the adult system. And the other is a direct file, which is where a DA makes the decision that they want to prosecute a youth as an adult. Um, Sacramento is one of the higher, uh, uses direct file at a higher rate than some other counties at 25.4 per thousand. San Francisco is clearly leading the way with very few direct files and Ventura County is one of the worst with 122. And so another issue is how can we reduce direct files um, in order to make sure that students are able to access rehabilitation services within facilities rather than being put in the adult system, which is less uh, suited uh, to rehabilitate, improve, and um, help those kids reach their full potential. So I see my role specifically on the commission, um, or, or the, the role of our commission, um, really to investigate ways to reduce individuals entering the system, and whether it's through um, the programming, uh, restorative justice, or working with probation and the DAs to reduce direct files. These are all things that we can be involved in, and we hope to make a difference in the lives of youth in Sacramento County through our work. And that's it. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, Let's see. Now, I'm always technically challenged, so I'm going to bear with me here while I make this disappear. Okay. Um, anyway, it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, let me tell you a, a little bit about how I got involved in juvenile justice. I've been involved for about the last 15 years uh, on a number of different levels. Uh, first and foremost, I'm a treating child and adolescent psychiatrist. I work in a probation facility in Los Angeles County. Uh, I have worked also at a community day school in Los Angeles County, which I organized uh, some mental health support for students in a uh, in a community uh, um, day school. Uh, I have uh, co-chaired a juvenile justice task force. Uh, on reform uh, for about the last 12 years uh, as a, a member of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. And I have managed the mental health services for the uh, juvenile justice system in Los Angeles County um, earlier um, in the early uh, 2000s uh, as we were being investigated by the Department of Justice. Uh, I uh, currently 
sit on the California Rehabilitation Oversight Board uh, appointed by the uh, uh, Speaker of the State Assembly and the board's responsibility is to provide information uh, in forms of reports to the state legislature on a periodic basis about rehabilitation services f for adults in the state prison system. So uh, I've been immersed in, in this arena for quite a while. Um, I have uh, prepared enough slides for two days in Sacramento and, and um, I, like you, I'd rather be home. I, and so uh, I, you're going to have to bear with me. Uh, I'm going to fly through just a few of the slides and uh, the others you have as uh, informational resources uh, in your packet. And uh, so, Karen, please uh, keep me honest here in terms of my time because, you know, I'll go on and on uh, about this topic. Um, let me share with you a little bit of national data with respect to uh, youth who are incarcerated across the country. What we have seen is a markedly decreasing rate of incarceration of youth since 1997. As you can see there in the top row, uh, uh, the number of youth incarcerated have decreased from 117,000 approximately to uh, 79,000. And just below that you can see the types of the categories of offenses and uh, Importantly is that we have decreased the number of status offenders who are incarcerated uh, rather dramatically, about by 50% across the country since 1997. Uh, where we haven't made a lot of um, progress is with respect to something that has already been mentioned, and that is the incarceration of children of, of color. As you can see from this, again, these are national statistics, 68% uh, of youth who are incarcerated are of color. And uh, the black population of youth is the one that is most highly impacted, as you can see from this data. Again, I'm going to just whiz through uh, many of these slides. Uh, this is uh, the count of youth detained by year in California. These are relative rates. Um, that the Department of Justice collects as they do with the other data that I showed you previously. And you can see the uh, uh, count of youth here uh, by color. I'm not going to identify each one. This data reflects the reporting by probation departments across the state to the Board of State and Community Corrections, which they are supposed to do on a quarterly basis. And so what you see here is the number of youth who are incarcerated. ADP stands for Average Daily Population. And so the second quarter of 2013, which is the latest data that the state has uh, published, is uh, just over 8,600. 8, This is uh, data with respect to the ages of those youth who are incarcerated. And you can see that the preponderance of youth are 15 to 17 year olds. Uh, this is data related to uh, each county's incarceration rate. Not so surprisingly, Los Angeles has uh, the highest, and for this quarter accounts for 27% of the entire 
population of youth who are incarcerated. These are only county data. This does not include the several hundred that are in the Division of Juvenile Justice, formerly known as CYA. Okay, and San Diego uh, follows. Um, this uh, next slide uh, is the second 10 in order of incarceration rates of youth. And together, these 20 counties account for uh, nearly 90% of all the youth who are incarcerated in California. This is data reflecting um, the uh, average daily capacity. You, as you can see here across California, as you saw with the national data, we are incarcerating youth uh, much frequently than we did in 2008. So if you compare 2008 with 212 in juvenile halls, these are just juvenile halls, it has decreased quite a bit. So we're going in the right direction. Uh, this is a distribution of charges, misdemeanors, the light gray, and felonies, the, the dark gray bars. This is data from camps. Uh, again, I think uh, we're going in the right direction in terms of decreasing numbers uh, of youth in camps uh, between 08 and 12. And uh, these are distribution of charges, which hasn't changed much over that same time period, 08 to 12. Uh, as a child and adolescent psychiatrist, uh, and those of you who are in the mental health field, uh, you may have some interest in this kind of data, and that relates to the number of open mental health so-called cases. Uh, again, this is county data, and this is only quarterly data, so it's not an annual report. Um, and so you can see that uh, in the second quarter, two youth required psychiatric hospitalization during this quarter across the state. Uh, you should also note that there were 61 reported suicide attempts in juvenile halls across the state for this quarter. These, uh, these data reflect the open mental health cases across juvenile halls and camps, so uh, it hasn't changed uh, a lot over this period of time. These data reflect the number of youth in juvenile halls and camps across the state who are on psychotropic medications. So we've kind of leveled off here uh, in 13. Suicide attempts uh, up and down. Completed suicides in this quarter, none. Uh, this study I want to share with you only because the data here is quite compelling. This relates to a study done on approximately 1,800 randomly selected youth in Cook County uh, Juvenile Detention Facility, which they followed for up to eight years. And they did a very, very thorough uh, follow-up on each one of these youth, including looking at health records, public health records, and so forth. And what they found was that within eight years, there were 65 deaths of these youth. Not surprisingly, uh, the number of minority youth is quite high. The deaths of the 65 youth, Cook County, which is Chicago, for those of you who are not familiar with the name Cook, 95% uh, died by homicide or legal intervention, which means generally uh, at the hands of uh, public safety. And this data, I think, is better explained on this slide which 
uh, in summary of the Cook County data, concludes that the mortality rate among delinquent youth was four times that of the general population, that among females, the mortality rate was eight times that of the general population. And that is just within an eight-year period of follow-up that they did of these youth. Eight times. Uh, so, and 90% of the deaths were from homicides, more than 90%. So this is quite sobering data. And so clearly we need major changes in our systems in order to, frankly, save these youth. This is a data that reflects um, the incidence of mental disorders among the juvenile justice <coughs> population. In a very large study conducted by the National Center of Mental Health and Juvenile Justice, of which I had the pleasure of being on their advisory board, um, it was found that 43% of youth, which the sample was about 1,500 in three state, states, included youth who were incarcerated, youth who were in the juvenile justice system but lived in, in the community, uh, and then others who lived in residential uh, centers. They found that 43% had four or more mental disorders. And then um, the, the other data on this slide uh, should be self-evident. Uh, what is also notable is that um, in this uh, data set that the females had higher rates of mental disorders than males. And these are the major categories of, of mental disorders. Any mental disorder, including substance use disorder, the females uh, 81% approximately uh, had at least one, and males, there were uh, just under 70%. Um, this data reflects some of the published studies uh, that have to do with post-traumatic stress disorder in incarcerated youth exclusively. And what we find is that uh, with respect to the males, which is on the left-hand side there, the, the group of bars on the left-hand side, approximately 30% of male youth have post-traumatic stress disorder. And on the right-hand side, we see those two bars, which are exclusively uh, females. Uh, we see a rate of 50%. So what are the risk factors for mental disorders? And this information is from various studies that have been conducted. Exposure to toxins such as alcohol and drugs uh, during pregnancy, premature births, genetic <clears throat> factors, so mental disorders have a genetic factor, poverty, being raised in the child welfare system, limited or poor bonding during early childhood, being a victim of child abuse and neglect, having been exposed to psychological trauma, being the subject of harsh or inconsistent discipline, having traumatic brain injury. There was a recent study that has hit all the, uh, the uh, newspapers across the country on youth who are incarcerated in New York City a detention system where 49% of youth have traumatic brain injury. The problem with that, aside from the obvious, is that there's an increased risk for a lot of impulsive behavior, suicide attempts, and those kinds of behaviors that we might from time to time consider to be antisocial. Having a parent who has been in the prison system uh, is also a risk factor, and then having maladaptive peer influences. How am I for time, Karen? Two, Two more minutes, she says. Okay. <laughs> so uh, the National Center for Mental Health and Juvenile Justice 
Center, um, uh, National Center for Mental Health and Juvenile Justice published a uh, monograph, which is a comprehensive model for communities uh, in, uh, on how to develop a system that m might better serve youth with uh, mental health challenges. And what they speak to a lot about is that, first of all, youth shouldn't have to go into the juvenile justice system to get any help. I mean, that's kind of a duh kind of thing, but that happens in many communities. If they have to ha go into the juvenile justice system, they should be in the least restrictive setting, and only unless there are major public safety issues, they should not be in detention facilities for very long. Uh, mental health screens should be used, uh, especially those that are standardized. Families, caregivers uh, should be partners in treatment decisions and plans. Multiple systems <coughs> bear responsibility, and so the multiple systems should be involved in any planning for such youth. And personally, education may be the most important because without educational skills, it doesn't matter how much mental health I, service I can provide any youth. If you know they don't learn how to add and read, uh, they're not going to make it. Uh, in fact, uh, approximately 30% of youth in the juvenile justice system have learning disabilities. And I'm not, not sure that our systems do uh, any, provide the kind of service that they need. So, uh, since I am out of time, sort of, right? Um, I'm going to let you look at the rest of the slides on your own, but there's one thing I want to bring to your attention, which Pam, who walked in late, and she'll get a demerit for such, um, <laughs> will speak about uh, later today, and that is uh, interventions for youth that are effective. And this is uh, a, a, a sort of laundry list, which she may allude to, uh, many of, the, of which are available in communities across the state. Uh, let me underscore the importance of family involvement, uh, particularly if they're available, and the uh, necessity to address co-occurring substance use problems with these youth. And finally, uh, something that Pam may not touch on, but I think as a person who has to make decisions about how to use money, uh, we need to invest in youth, frankly, as wisely as we possibly can if we're going to get them out of the pipeline. And so to that end, these uh, acronyms here uh, are written out on the previous slide, and you can uh, uh, go back to, to the previous slide uh, and just review what a cost-benefit analysis is of each one of these interventions. So uh, uh, with that, I'll, I'll end by saying that uh, there are two slides with a number of resources that uh, you can use. Um, at your uh, leisure or when you're planning to uh, improve services for youth in, in uh, your community. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. Um, of course, I'm very happy to be here to discuss this subject, school to prison pipeline. Just by listening to the previous speakers, I realize I'm going to probably bring a slightly different slant to this discussion. Um, hopefully, it will stimulate some of you to maybe think about this issue, which I think is extremely, extremely complex with a lot of moving parts, involves things, as you can see from my slide, it involves race, class, education, which I'm going to deal with from my side of it, and of course the juvenile justice system. So, uh, so for my presentation today, uh, the objectives I'm going to try to achieve is I'm going to try to talk about the things that feed the school to prison pipeline from the education side. Then I'm going to talk about some state initiatives and some recommendations. Now, I too had to reduce my presentation because I typically have more slides with more information, but I think this will do. So, uh, yeah, so I'll jump right in. So speaking about demographics as it relates to feeding the school to prison pipeline, I think it's critically important to know that when we talk about feeding the pipeline, we talk about school, we have to talk about who the students are. So in California, we saw a dramatic increase in student enrollment from 1980, 1990s, and then up to 2000. And then it sort of leveled off at about 6.2 million students. And that's important because the students that sort of grew that number, grew in number were uh, brown kids. They were Latinos, they were Hispanic students. And what's also as interesting about that growth period is that the teacher population remained the same. So in other words, the student population grew in terms of the minority students to about 70% black, brown kids, Asian kids. The teacher population remained the same, predominantly white teachers. Now, is that a problem necessarily? Maybe not, but it's something for us to think about as we talk about the school to prison pipeline. So I want you to sort of take this pie chart and just sort of put it in your brain, put it in your back burner because this is the foundation. Students don't go to prison by themselves. The pipeline exists for a reason. There is a, a foundation here. So again, just sort of just keep this in your hip pocket. So uh, some of the challenges that we face. Certainly we know that English language learners has been a big, uh, has been a big uh, what sort, of, uh, sort of drive on our educational system here in California. And it's grown to, at, uh, is increased by a rate of 364% over the last 29 years. And that's important once again because that population has to be served. They have to be educated. And we have to ask ourselves in the education world, again, have we done a good job of doing that? Because we know it's critically important and it plays into the narrative once again of who's capable of, of being successful in our system. And then we talk about special education. Same type of thing. We've seen a lot of growth in special education. And that's interesting as well because the special education uh, group has grown for several reasons, right? I mean, some cases, of course, we have more special, edu more special education uh, students legitimately. But also, too, we know that disproportionately, kids of color have been sent into special education. So they have grown it that way as well. That also, too, creates another challenge, another need. And then we'll go to economics. We'll go to kids that are predominantly poor, kids who aren't poor. And we see that, too, that population has grown dramatically. So just keep in mind that all these things have been happening over the past few years in our school systems, and our school systems have had to try to deal with that. And in some cases, we've done a poor job of trying to fix it or trying to work with it, so to speak. So in some ways that creates the energy to send kids from school into the pipeline. 
But I think also, I think Dr. Rowe, you think he hit upon a very, very important point, which is why I'm here, academic performance. If students aren't educated, they certainly won't make it. So let's just look at this, uh, this graphic just quickly. Okay, English Language Arts CST is a California standards test which all California students must take. The thing about this test, which, uh, which as of I guess this year is going to stop because now we're going to move to Common Core, but this is just to give you just an idea of what has been happening. And I'm just going to look at eighth graders here. Okay, it's typically done for 8 and 11. So as you can see, uh, for years 2003, 10, and 13, you can see that for the fourth grade in 2003, you basically see that students have improved, correct? Right? Eighth grade, same thing, correct? Okay, 11th grade, same thing, right? But what you might not notice here is that if you look at the way they are progressing, as they go through our school system, they actually are doing worse. So they start out at one level in fourth grade, or, and they, through our system, don't do quite as well. If you don't do quite as well, why would you want to stay in school? Now let's look at some of the subgroups, or what I like to call <coughs> the Browns. We have an education gap, what you call the achievement gap. And this graphic is from 2002 through 2010. But this happens and remains about the same each year. And what it's basically saying is this, that when we compare the Latino child to his white counterpart in English language arts for the eighth grade, they consistently underperform. When we look at African Americans doing the exact same thing, compared to the white counterpart in our school systems, they consistently underperform. And this didn't happen last week. This has been over time. So when we talk about a school-to-prison pipeline, this didn't just happen last week. We've had this issue of undereducating a certain segment of our population for a number of years. And this, to me, I think is very telling. Because many times you will hear people say in education that students of poverty, for the most part, I guess poverty may be one of the reasons why they're not succeeding. But this graphic clearly shows you that in 2010, if we were to look at this data, the things on the right, I don't know if you guys can see it, but on the right-hand side of each one of these columns, those are lines going through. And on the other side, they're solid. So the ones on the right-hand side are those who are not disadvantaged. The ones on the left are those who are. They're poor and not poor, OK? But what's very interesting about this to me is that when we look at this, we see that poor white students are outperforming the Latino and black kids who are not poor. So if poverty were the issue, then we wouldn't see this happening. Right? So these are part of some of the challenges that are in our school systems. And it's been systemic, it's constant, and it always revolves around Latino and black students. Suspension and expulsion. Obviously, uh, this is a big deal as well. But this gets to behavior, which I'll talk about later if I have any more time, because I have a little slightly different twist on this, uh, but I'll save it. But anyway, I'll say it this way. So for right now, uh, again, the state has started to collect this data for the very first time in 11-12. Uh, in so we can now look at side-by-side uh, -side data. We can see now year after year, right, this thing around suspension and expulsions. So, I mean, so to our credit, I guess we can say that we see a decrease in expulsions and we see a decrease in suspensions as well. Uh, those, are all, those are all good things. We also see that with the subgroups, right, they too have been reduced. In other words, we're seeing a drop in the suspension for African Americans, for Latinos, as well as for white students. Right, all good things. But still, even though we see those drops, there's still another piece of this puzzle that we have to talk about. There's still disparities. Because in 11-12, this population, African-American students make up 6.3% of the population, but they are suspended at 16.2%. 
right? Latinos, same thing as you can see, 52.7 to 54.6. And with white students, 25.5 to 20.9. So there should be a common theme you should be hearing from me right now. It seems that the black and brown kids in our educational system are sort of getting the short end of the stick in many ways. We have to do a better job as educators to make this change. So state initiatives. Uh, needless to say, uh, CDE is the state agency, and the superintendent is the leader, and he's a political person. So we've embarked upon some things that we think are important in this particular time, but I think there's more to be done. So anyway, let's talk about some of the state initiatives. So we, too, have collaborated with other entities around the state to try to create some positive alternatives to suspension and expulsion. And in some ways, I think we're getting, uh, we're getting some traction. Uh, we've also, too, had the opportunity to get with some other state groups to talk about behavior intervention, as well as chronic absenteeism, because if you're not in school, of course, you can't be educated. And we've also held some regional workshops around the state looking at restorative justice, school-wide positive behavior interventions, and the like. And we've also uh, seen through some districts, LA, Vallejo, and Napa, that they've actually managed to reduce some of their suspension and expulsion rates. Those are all good things, as well as us working to post some of our strategies online. All good things. But there's more to do. There's a lot more to do. Because this, to me, just gets at the tip of the iceberg. So I'm going to propose some recommendations that we, from a state level, that we as educators probably should embark upon as we try to stem the tide of students going from the school to prison pipeline. And more specifically, black and brown kids being caught in that pipeline. So first of all, my recommendation would be this. First, we need to close the achievement gap. We need to make sure that our schools are set up where students can walk in and achieve. And there are many ways to go about doing that. And some of that deals with expectations. Some of that deals with engagement. And, and let me be clear. Let me be perfectly clear. You have to make sure you connect with students in order to have students want to do the work. There's no way of getting around it. So what I'm saying is that we need to look at Several things, well, I'll hold back on that. We need to look at several things, but I'll move on to say this. So we also, too, have to create policies around equity. Okay? Not equal, but equity. We need to give and make sure students get the supports and academic help they need. Those who need it most should get more. We need to improve the administrator and teacher preparation programs which are college programs, which basically those programs are in colleges and they prepare us but they prepare the future teachers and administrators. And those programs many times do not prepare teachers adequately to go into the neighborhoods in which they're sent. Thus, we see this thing called the achievement gap. So they can learn in the classroom, but they can transfer that to the urban environment as an example. And teacher placement. Teacher placement is critically important as well because we also know, too, from the education side that many times new hires are sent to the most difficult school environments and the teachers who are least effective seem to also to wind up there. So when we talk about the school to prison pipeline, we talk about black and brown kids, if you're the educators or you're the administrators or you are having to deal with that type of element, surely you would see those gaps in student performance. And finally, and this is my big one, we need to do professional development around culturally responsive practices as well as unconscious bias. And here's why I told you to keep that pie chart in the back of your head that I showed you in the beginning. 70% of our student population or more are kids of color. 70% of our teaching population are white. That's not bad necessarily. I'm not making a racist statement. I'm just making a statement of fact. And I'm also going on to say that there is a way to work with the teachers we have, and part of that work is through professional development. I'm saying this, that teachers need to be culturally responsive as it relates to the students in which they teach. It is impossible for you to teach students if you don't know where they are, if you don't know who they are. And this practice 
has worked in other parts of the country. We just need to be more engaged and more serious about doing it. Unconscious bias training, same type of thing. We all walked in this room today with biases, all of us. Doesn't mean you're racist, doesn't mean you hate, it just means the things you bring to this arena. We're saying that in the education world, we as educators need to do a better job to make sure we know what our biases are right? so we can get past that and teach our kids. Because if I'm a teacher in the fourth grade and I see a young man come in with dreadlocks and sagging and bagging, do I have something in my head that says he can't learn? The aunt, exactly. Many, many of the answers, yes. So they teach that way. This type of training will help to sort of move the dial, I think. And then finally, School climate. School climate is huge because school climate is what the school's all about. When you walk onto the campus, is it friendly? Is it trashed? Are people fighting? Are there arguments going on? The school climate needs to be managed and set up in a way to be welcoming. And not just for students, but for parents as well. Because parents send schools the best kids they have. And it's the school's job to try to educate those kids. And they need to be in an environment in which the educational attainment is there for them as well. So I'm going to pull back in my time. I'm sure it's probably getting close to near. I hope I've tried to inspire you to, of course, uh, take this conversation further. But we realize in education there's a lot more work to be done. Thank you. I want to thank our presenters. They have shared a lot of very uh, interesting data, have um, posed some challenges for us to think about. And, um, and what I want to do at this time is open it up to all of you. We have about 15 minutes. And um, I had an opportunity to talk with some of you um, in the room before we got started today. And I know a lot of you um, come with uh, a rich background of experience and knowledge yourself. And some of you are doing some quite interesting um, things in your own region. So I encourage you to come forward. I believe we have some microphones on that side of the room. Um, and it uh, looks like they're going to be walking around with the mic. So why don't you go ahead and raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question, uh, provide a comment. Um, yes, go ahead. Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Jamila Brooks and I'm with the Children's Defense Fund. Um, I just wanted to mention a couple things and then also uh, ask a question. Um, one, at CDF we believe there's actually a cradle to prison pipeline, so children are born into circumstances um, that funnel them into the justice system and it happens actually before school if you're born into the foster care system, if your parent didn't have access to um, a prenatal care, you don't have access to early child education, so I would just encourage that when we're thinking about this, we're not totally focused on the schools because they're often inheriting big structural issues that we need to address. And the second thing is, um, I did want to mention that I think we at CDF would also argue it's not necessarily an achievement gap, it's an opportunity gap. Um, some children have opportunities, some don't. And so to frame it sometimes with achievement gap, it puts a lot of pressure on children where it's really adults that are causing the problems. As Mary Edelman, my boss says, we don't have a children problem, we have an adult problem and we need to focus on it because they're inheriting a lot of situations. So I, I did want to mention that. Um, and the third thing is, um, uh, I was hoping to hear a little bit about one of the main things that's causing a lot of disproportionality and suspensions and really funneling kids into the juvenile justice system, which is willful defiance, um, which is, you know, you can suspend children under willful defiance for pretty much anything, you know, from talking back in class to having a cell phone. And that's when you really see a lot of the disproportionalities. But my question is actually, um, you mentioned one of the things I haven't heard before is the kind of the role that standardized testing might play in contributing to push out, and you note, and you mentioned um, uh, the, the last speaker mentioned, if you're not performing well on this test, why would you want to come to school? So I wondered if you can kind of expand on any kind of thoughts about how that might actually contribute to push out, and whether or not the state um, is actually thinking about kind of changing standardized testing to because of that. Sure. Uh, yeah, the state is thinking about changing standardized tests, and they are. Uh, as a matter of fact, we're going to Common Core, which I mentioned. Um, but yeah, but standardized tests. Uh, I mean, obviously, they create an environment whereby if students aren't, uh, if they aren't performing, then obviously they feel some worth in that. And as we test them through, as I've already said, 
then if they're not performing and teachers sort of get this, this perception of what these kids are as they move through, this, through these grades, right, then why would they want to stay? It, it, I mean, to me, it's, it's pretty basic. If I'm getting C's in the fourth grade, D's in the fifth, and I'm not seeing any light at the end of the tunnel, then as soon as I get the first chance to leave or if I become a behavioral problem, I'm out the door. So I can see how, but again, I think it's not just testing, it's about educating, right? So we need to do a better job of educating so they can do better on tests. That's where I'm coming from. And I also just want to share this with you too. The achievement gap conversation, opportunity gap, I get that. But I think the biggest thing to remember is there's a gap. Kids are not performing when they are compared to other subgroups. And to me, that's the bigger message. Because if they don't perform, there will be a place for them outside of education. And typically, that's incarceration. Uh, if I may contribute to this discussion, and thank you very much for your comments. I really appreciate uh, the comments related to um, the issue about uh, not having access to prenatal care because that is so important for uh, people of color. That being said, however, I want to um, get back to education and some data recently released by the U.S. Department of Education related to preschool uh, suspension data. Black children comprise 18% of those who are in preschool. <coughs> However, they comprise 48% of suspensions from preschool. All right, so we're not talking about achievement tests. We, we haven't got there yet. Okay, so uh, we have serious problems with our systems. Yes. Although black children account for 18% of those who are enrolled in preschool, they account for 48% of all preschool suspensions. Okay. Now, now I do have a question. <laughs> uh, the question is, um, I'd like to know from your perspective what a, a healthy school climate is like. My children went to um, high school in San Jose, California, predominantly white, where they were miserable. And then they went to Howard University where they just blossomed. For those of you who don't know, it's a, it's a historically black university. And they thrived. So there's a difference. So I'd like you to, you to just sort of share with us what uh, a healthy school climate might look like. Sure, that's a great, that's a great question. I, I think a healthy school climate is one in which you walk into the school environment and you see yourself. You, you can walk in and you can identify with the environment. You're welcomed, you're not looked at as a problem. You have, uh, you have resources that every other kid should have. You're not looking at chipped paint on the walls. You're not going to a uh, bathroom where toilets don't flush. Teachers know you by name. There, there, is, there is an environment, there's a community environment there. And just, uh, just one quick example. Um, so maybe four years ago I went to a school in Compton. And it was a school that was a, uh, what I call a high flyer but all around it, the other schools were doing terrible. And when I walked in, I immediately understood why. When I got to the office, the people welcomed me from CDE, and on the bulletin board, they had all the students' names and they were attached to a college. I thought, what a great idea. When they go there, they don't think about, hey, I'm in the third grade, right? There's, uh, there's a pathway for you. And so the teachers were welcoming. So to me, I think the climate, for the most part, has to have those types of, of pieces. We have a question over oh, here. Oh, I was going to go. Uh, my name is Matt Tretz. I work at Sutter County Probation. Uh, the first thing I was going to say is the knee-jerk reaction. I was going to talk about the high school level, 
but when I heard, uh, I believe, William say that uh, preschool suspension, I mean, that just alone is crazy. Why would we ever suspend preschool, I mean, kids? Um, to me, that would be a classic knee-jerk reaction. I've heard kindergartens being suspended, but even then, they don't even know the behavior that they're doing. I mean, so to suspend them, 50%, uh, to me, that just seems crazy. The other thing I don't see on the recommendations, it's all about the teachers, teachers, teachers. We need better at, well, parenting always, of course, because that's where it starts in probation. I mean, if we don't get the parents on board, forget it. But I don't see anything. I worked in the high schools for four and a half years. I don't see anything about the administrators. The knee-jerk reactions come from when the teachers send them for a cell phone, for you know, just having a bad day, talking back, and then the admin five days out because they don't like his attitude. There needs to be something from the state that doesn't allow that because I can go from the two different high schools in Sutter County. One admin would get it and say, okay, the kid's having a bad day. We're going to send you home for today, and we'll get you right back tomorrow. The other admin would send them home for five days and start that process of just counting so many days until you expel the kid. And we know if you expel a kid and get them to the continuation school, there's your pipeline. So the pipeline starts with the administrators to me, and the sad part is at the very beginning, I heard there was four or five school administrators here. I'm glad to see that a judge is here, um, but that's, that's just the bigger problem. Um, you can't solve it until you figure that out. And I'm just amazed that 50% of kindergartens are going home for any reason. You got them there in a safe environment, you need to keep them there. That just really upsets me. I just, um, before, before you comment, I just want to let the, the folks who are supporting us with mics that we have a, a, a comment or a question <laughs> over here. And then we have a gentleman with, uh, in, the, in the Navy in the hat who's been diligently raising his hand. So I just want to call your attention to that. It might be hard to see from the floor. Go ahead and comment, please, if you uh, yeah, I'll just say just, I'll just say really briefly. First of all, just recognize this list is not all-encompassing. Let's, right, let's just say that for starters. And remember, too, that this is a very complicated, complex situation with a lot of moving parts. But I do appreciate your comments. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I just wanted to make a comment and to thank you for the term unconscious bias. And um, the reason that I like that term so well is because for many years I've done training to help people understand white privilege. And when you say the term white privilege, it just makes everyone mad. Um, then everybody's defensive and learn nothing. So I appreciate that term. I like it much better. Thank you. I wanted to comment on something that was said about administration. Not, administration. They, okay, so you suspend students for little things, but what you don't see is the administrators promise to help the student while they're suspended to do their work that they're missing but administrators don't help because I've been in the same situation and I got suspended for two months and the administrator promised to help me go into independent studies till I could get transferred over to a continuation high school me and my parent my mom went every day to get work from them and they never provided work. She said that she would have it, but she never did. So I went without education for two months. And when I got back into a regular high school, I was so lost that it took me so long to catch up. And now, basically, I went back to see if there was, if I can get put back into the high school. And they're saying that I can't get put back because my credits are too low. But at the school I'm going to, I'm making up my credits. I have more credits than I already should. But the administrator is saying that I am not allowed on campus because I was gone for too long. So she is not helping actually at all with anything that is going on in the situations. And she is suspending me. She suspended me at first for three days. I go back and then she expels me for being on campus. And it wasn't even my fault. She put hands on me. 
So I really do agree with what he said about administrators. We need to pay attention to them more than the students because they are messing us up more. Mm -hmm. Appreciate your comment. Thank you very much. Can I come <coughs> to her? Um, thank you for sharing. And I think that's something that we all didn't discuss is this disconnect between when you're removed from school and you get behind in the work. Individuals who go to a youth detention facility, there's no law that requires students, um, teachers to send home their homework um, and to make sure that students stay on track. And so if you're removed from one of the big problems with exclusionary discipline, it's exactly what you're pointing out. It's not just being absent, it's that you don't have that access. And there's just simply no requirement whether you're in an institution or whether you're you know, simply <coughs> suspended. Um, and that's how a lot of kids are getting behind here. And the more likely you, if you're suspended and you get behind, that uh, raises your chances of dropping out of high school and all of that. In uh, contributes to the possibility of being incarcerated later in life. So I think it's a really important comment and certainly something that um, should be greatly considered. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Edgar, uh, working with Catholic Charities with a mentoring program. So uh, I, was, I, I know that you were saying that it's the tip of the iceberg and we have a lot of recommendations. Uh, and I think that's one of the big uh, ideas that a lot of some of these kids come from single p parent families or maybe they don't have that positive influence at home and there's people in the community that are willing to invest their time into these uh, mentoring programs and it works the statistics work uh, the government is doing as much as they can but you know putting a little bit uh, more funding into that if possible uh, we're seeing some of these kids that are uh, on the risk of being whether it's truancy whether depending on the program itself, uh, we do a one-on-one -on -one, uh, community outreach similar to what Big Brothers Big Sisters do with the case management component. So it's it, it, it goes a long way in uh, barely starting this program, but it also helps some of these kids, whether it's a school-based mentoring program as well. Uh, a lot of the parents sometimes living in disadvantaged areas have to leave their kids in after-school programs because they work until five or six. So a lot of the time, it, you know, they, they don't have that time at home to, to be with the parent and let alone what you were talking about, the, the language barrier that also brings. So it's, it's a lot of factors, but I think one of the things, uh, another recommendation to add on a list of them would be a mentoring program, just because there is a lot of people out in the community that are willing to help out. Thank you. We're going to go back to the side of the room, please. OK, so like, you know how you like, when the administrators tell you that if you have an issue, like due like to bullying and stuff like that, that they'll take it into their own matters. Well, I reported it my freshman year in high school because I was constantly being bullied by a student. And I told my administrator, the assistant principal, and she told me, she was like, well, I'll call him in when he's here. And he was never there. But then when he did show up, she just still didn't call him in. And I told my mom that I didn't like how it was happening because he continued to bully me. And then when I finally got upset enough, I told the principal, like literally, I went over the assistant principal and went to the principal's office, and I told him what was going on, and the, store, the school didn't do nothing about it. They really just did not. And that is unfair because I think that if somebody's taking the time so they won't do something that's, that's gonna mess them up in their future, you guys should actually pay attention to the students and not just focus on like what you guys have in mind for doing for the next week. We waited three weeks to go back just to see if anything was gonna happen. And the principal stated to my mom, oh, we're doing the best we can, but nothing's happened so far, and we're not planning on doing anything about it. Any comments from our presenters? Well, there are a couple of pieces of legislation right now um, that are creating comprehensive anti-bullying measures um, for schools in California. It's SB 840 by Senator Lara and SB 1455 um, I mean, AB 1455 by um, Assemblywoman Nora Campos, I believe. And so hopefully um, there will be some type of solution because I think that it's really important what you're bringing up, not only your experience and the responsibility of the administrators, but also the responsibility of our schools to you know, really address and have comprehensive measures um, to, to deal with bullying. And so what these bills would do would create uh, referral systems to mental health services, would make uh, and allow, allowing witnesses and uh, the people who are experiencing bullying to be uh, referred to those services, and also um, creating particular safeguards to ensure that this type of thing doesn't happen again. So um, I know that you're upset about your experience. There is hope. And there is also a way to get involved in changing that if you um, ever seek to at the state level. 
Yeah, I was just, just, just going to say just uh, really quickly that uh, to me that speaks to school climate. There's a climate in that school that's allowed, where this is allowed to happen. I think we just have to also admit that all administrators aren't good and all teachers aren't good. I think it's up to students and those in those educational environments to raise the level of conversation around those people and get to people who can sort of help me uh, sort of move that dial. Because I really don't think that you as a student is going to sit around and wait for legislation, right? You want something to happen now. So I'm saying to you, it would probably be wise to speak to someone who is at that level or others to maybe sort of try to change some of those dynamics. I think we have time for two more questions. I understand. You brief, someone briefly alluded to the comment about zero tolerance. And I know some of this came about during the, when the so-called war on drugs came. And I'm finding that part of this whole situation is, is a result of these. What's being done to eliminate this concept of zero tolerance and putting in some intelligent disciplinary policies on a state level that's uniform across the state, not just by district, but uniform. So if this kid moves from San Juan um, School District in Sacramento to the Campbell Unified School District in San Jose, for example, those policies and rules are going to be the same. And a kid can expect the same disciplinary actions, and there's that co consistency and continuity. What's being done about that? Or is that just a, a, a pipe dream to go along with the pipeline? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, no, you're, you're the education expert, so I'm going to defer to you. But I, I, I want to um, say ditto to your to your comments. I, I think that the zero tolerance policies really need to be revised uh, in a very big way. Uh, but it's going to take uh, state legislation. Uh, and I think there have been some attempts very recently um, uh, I wanted to say that Senator Yee sponsored such a bill very recently, uh, but uh, those policies really need to be changed. Yeah, and I'll just piggyback that thought to say that I think that they will be changed as well. I think that that the uh, the tide is shifting. I think folks realize that they that they really don't work, um, which is why we're into things like restorative justice yeah. and the like. So, I mean, so I think. At, Again, I think that will shift, will change. I just don't have any particulars on that for you for right now. I yeah. do agree with you as well. Yeah, I, and if I may, in addition to the zero tolerance policies, because I, I have a, uh, a uh, colleague, friend, who uh, was an administrator of San Diego Unified and described to me this uh, rather informal study they did of uh, youth who were subject to zero tolerance policies. And what they discovered was that um, approximately 80% of these students were in need of uh, a variety of support services uh, and primarily mental health services in, in his uh, thinking. Uh, and so if, if zero tolerance policies are gonna be revamped, Students need to be supported in some way so that they, in fact, can resume their education because without their education, obviously, uh, it's going to be a rough life. We have time for just one more question. Um, yeah, my question relates to um, the local control funding formula and how it's rolling out at the individual district level. And I'm wondering if um, through CDE, as like, oh, like is there an oversight role or with some of the other agencies up here, um, if there's any actual connection with the local districts looking at what their LCAP is going to be, what their action plan is going to be related to things like restorative justice, related to things like connection to social services, and, and if there's any technical assistance and real kind of advocacy for best practices happening there. Yeah, actually, um, yeah, I, mean, I don't know exactly what's going on with the LCAP in terms of at CDE, someone else actually is involved with that, so I don't really have any information uh, for you related to that. But I mean, but that's a great, that's a great question. That's a great question. 
I just want to acknowledge that um, I know there are a lot of other hands that are up there that we didn't get to, and I apologize, but we're just trying to keep on schedule here. And so um, thank you all for your comments and your questions, um, especially for our um, folks over here who shared their um, own um, examples um, to enlighten the group here that is here today. Um, I think it took a lot of courage to do that. I just want to acknowledge that and, and um, thank you both very much. And, um, and if you would join me in um, thanking our presenters for bringing the information.